So <laughs> you'll have read in the book that the number one thing we teach at, at one level, you could take 300 pages of this book and, and reduce it to six words that the goal of all communication, you're always trying to do one thing ultimately, which is powerfully land a small, small number, number, a big, big idea. Can you tell us what does that mean exactly? Okay. That is brilliant. So the human brain operates at the level of ideas. It doesn't primarily operate at the level of fact and data. In other words, I'll give you a great example. If you went to any presentation or even a couple of hours later uh, after this, this podcast, um, I think you said earlier you, you're married with a, with a baby. So, so imagine this evening you go home and your wife says, hey, what was that guy talking about? You're not going to, to give a discourse of this 30 minutes. You're going to say, oh, it was kind of interesting. It was this. And it was this, and it was this. Your brain and mine is, is reductionist. It takes information and it boils it to the level of ideas. Right. The best example from history, the best example is from the O.J. Simpson trial. So mm -hmm. you remember the O.J. Simpson trial, uh, seven months, I mean, for heaven's sake, seven months of mind-numbing prosecution testimony. <laughs> and history clearly... Uh, uh, demonstrates, reveals that that seven months was dismantled by one phrase, one idea right. of eight words. And I bet you know the idea, right? I love it, yeah. <laughs> if the glove, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Now, I, uh, I, I had a workshop yesterday with 35 really? people and unprompted, I, even just the mention of the existence of that idea, hmm. they're all able to name it. But the, the verdict was handed down in early 95, that's 22 years ago. Mm. What I'm trying to say is ideas are sticky. We could play games all day on this, you know, um, help I've fallen and I can't get up. People, yeah. ideas stick in, in the brain. So you want to be memorable. You want to be sticky. The $200 PowerPoint guy was memorable. Right. But he didn't powerfully land a big idea. He powerfully landed a stupid game. What was remembered was the game, not his content. What you want to do as a communicator is understanding that the brain traffics in and operates at the level of ideas. You want to architect messaging to be fundamentally about ideas. If I'm in a sales call, I want the guy I've met with to leave. And then two or three days later, if asked by his boss or his management team, what was those guys talking about to say, oh, interesting. it was this and it was this and it was this. But if you go and look at literally 99.9% .9 of business presentations and PowerPoints, they operate at the level of fact and data, 60 slides, five bullets of slides, charts, graphs, tables. Yeah. Are facts and data important? Yes, in as much as they need to prove an idea. But the, but the brain operates at the level of the idea. So imagine I, I present you with an idea, which might be our solution is easy to implement. And then you as the customer would say, okay, I, interesting idea. That's an assertion. Can you prove it? I might show you some case studies, a little bit of data, maybe our process for how we, we work. And your brain says, okay, I believe it. I, I think I see Tim's telling the truth. Your brain then goes away. And what I want to happen is the idea to stick our solution is easy to implement. So what you have to do is organize and architect around ideas, support them with the best data you have, not the most data you can. That's really mm -hmm. important. Yes. Sometimes one great case study or one critical piece of data is easily enough to support the idea. But then let your communication be about ideas. And if you look throughout history, all great communication in any setting is about ideas. That's the traffic of the brain. And yet we've divorced ourselves from that and we've defaulted to fact and data and stats, largely, if you're interested, because we're Western rationalists. Our, our organizations teach us that you, know, you need fact, data, business cases, profit and loss, ROI, risk analysis. Mm -hmm. We've reduced everything to sort of the left brainness of of fact and data, as though do you, if I can, do you still see that happening in the in enterprise and companies? Oh yeah, I don't have one in front of me, uh, but um, I could show you a hundred and sixty slide PowerPoint deck. Mm -hmm. You'll love this story: a hundred and sixty slide PowerPoint deck oh with goodness. extraordinary technical detail designed mm -hmm. by engineers. Yeah, and it, it has been replaced by, okay, no kidding, a picture of a squirrel. Yeah, I could see that. And the reason is, 
Uh, now, there's a little bit more than that. There's a picture of a squirrel and then maybe a two or three page document. And, and now, that old version, 160 slide deck, is selling a solution that is, so give it to you in 10 seconds, it's really interesting. When your power goes out, something has hit a power line. And there's a fuse on the top of the power pole, right? And the fuse right. blows. Right. And then that's out for a couple of hours and they come and fix the fuse. What most people don't know is 75% of those faults are temporary. So the fuse didn't need to blow. And the joke is, it's often a squirrel that touches two lines. The squirrel gets fried, yeah. falls off the line, and then the line's fine. But the fuse is already blown. And so this solution is brilliant. It's one of our clients. What it does is it just checks the, the line for 10 seconds to see if the fault's cleared. Mm. And if the fault's cleared, it doesn't blow. If the fault's cleared, it does blow. Mm. And that 160 slide deck gets into the mechanics of that. But the basic story is you have a squirrel and every time a squirrel touches two lines and blows a fuse, you've got unhappy customers for three or four hours and it costs you $500 to roll a truck to fix it. Mm. That whole story is told through the lens of a picture of a squirrel, the big idea, 70% of faults are temporary. And then the really the second big idea is this product, which is called a trip saver can essentially check the line before deciding to blow. It's essentially an intelligent fuse. Right. That's wow. it. But the traditional engineering approach would, would, would embed that in 160 slides of fact and data. But it feels because so natural, right? It feels like a reflex. It seems like that's intuitively what we want to do. It's what we've been taught. Yeah, we've been taught that, you know, be thorough, be complete. Mm -hmm. um, the really interesting exercise we do in our classes is we ask, why do we do this? And why do we pack everything in? It's like, I want to cover my butt. I want to have an answer for every question. In fact, mm -hmm. a guy at the workshop yesterday said something funny. He said, I don't only want to have an answer for any question I might be asked. I want to have an answer for every question I've ever <laughs> been asked. I'm like, wow. yeah. um, we want to show that we've done our homework. Um, sure. we, we don't want to be embarrassed. So we, there are actually very powerful forces mm -hmm. that cause us to add material in. You ever been on a plane, watch a guy working on a PowerPoint, he's adding bullets, he's adding slides. One of the greatest disciplines of communication is what we call defoliation, is stripping out everything that is not really needed. Most communication, typical presentation at almost 70 to 80% of it didn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. Almost any story mm -hmm. can be told in a remarkably confined space if you reduce it to really big ideas. And then what's interesting is a week later, you ask the person who's been in a properly architected communication what they remember, and they'll remember it almost perfectly.